And this is joint work with Joe Saxo. Um, and this is a slightly different talk than what we saw before. So before we saw some uh, presentations about how to compensate for missing data. And what I'm more interested in is actually understanding the process that leads to the collection of the data and what are maybe aspects that influence that. And that's important because only if we understand the process, then we can correct for missing data. Yeah? And I'm looking at a specific thing, and that is nurse effects. And I'll explain what I mean by nurse effects and why they're important. So if you're here, I, you, uh, you're probably already convinced that biosocial data is really exciting. So I'm just going to mention shortly why this is important and kind of new. So social data has some advantages. So first of all, typically, or we like to think that it's representative. So that means we can make inferences about the entire population. They're also rich in context. So if you're a social scientist, you appreciate that we measure things like value, attitudes, uh, and we know those are important for how people behave. So we have very rich context, including, for example, I don't know, what their parents did when they were children, which might influence health outcomes, and lots of information from the social world. And we also have unobservables. And again, these are the kind of uh, social science unobservables, like attitudes and values that we can't really measure with anything else. And surveys are really good at measuring that. And the biological part, uh, first of all, yeah, we like to believe they're objective. Yeah, so that's an advantage that is often cited for biological data versus uh, like self-reports, for example. Uh, they're also rich in detail. So, for example, we have lots of information uh, about uh, stress. We have lots of indicators that uh, tell us in very detail uh, different stress levels. And that could be very useful for uh, looking at uh, health outcomes. And we have other types of unobservables, like genetic data, that could be used in different ways. Uh, so there's a sweet spot there in between where we have a combination of the two. So I think that's why uh, there's such a big push in investing in collecting biological data in representative surveys. So we have surveys like Understand Society, uh, uh, English Longitudinal Study of Aging, the Cohort Studies, uh, Health and Retirement Study. There's lots of studies that are surveys but also start to collect biological data. And the ideal is to uh, bring together the advantages of each. Yeah. So, and like I said, what's exciting is that we can answer new questions that we have never been able to do before. So, for example, if you have a longitudinal study, you could see how people change in time. You could understand the employment status of their parents when they were children. And then you could also look at how those influence uh, bio their biology, their stress hormones, for example. Uh, and we can also do exciting things like life course and uh, in which we use both social and biological measures. So for example, ELSA has multiple waves of biological data collection. So we could look at change in time uh, for, uh, for example, stress indicators. Uh, so this is really exciting. And again, I don't think we were able to answer these kind of questions with any other type of data. And with new data always comes kind of new difficulties. So some of the new things we have to figure out is how to collect this new data. So surveys uh, traditionally have been done very differently. We have interviewers going to the homes or maybe by telephone uh, collecting data. But now we need to collect things like uh, blood pressure or things like uh, actually uh, getting blood. So the question is, how do you do that in a representative sample? Uh, and there are different models to do that. So you could ask people to go to a clinic and collect data. You could send interviewers or you could send nurses. So there are different ways to do the same thing. And we need to figure out what's the best way to do that. Uh, and secondly, how to cor uh, correctly analyze it. So uh, we could assume that if, if it's in one database, everything is measured in the same way, but it's not really true. So as some of my colleagues already uh, mentioned, there are different stages of missing data that happen when you collect biological data. And that's different uh, than what happens with the survey, both because the person that collects them are, uh, is different, but also what we ask people to do is different. So we might have different mechanisms of missing, which are really important. 
so what I'm going to talk about in this short talk is uh, about the new actor in data collection. And I say new actor because I'm a survey methodologist. So I talk from the perspective of people that collect data until now, we didn't have to deal with nurses, okay? So this is some, well, or you could, but in a private, I don't know, you need to go to the hospital. We didn't really need to train them and work with them and convince them to do a good job. So this is really new. So I'm going to talk about how this new actor actually influences data collection. Um, so they have to do, the nurses have to do a couple of things. So first, they have to convince a participant to, to take part. So usually there's a main survey and then a few months later, uh, the nurse goes and collects biological data. And there are different models. So sometimes uh, they would be contacted by telephone and then the nurse just goes there and does her job. But sometimes she actually has to convince people to, uh, to participate. And again, this is very new for them. So most nurses sit in an office and people are desperate to come to them and get their help. It's not their job usually to go to people's home and convince them to give blood. That's like a very different thing than what they were initially trained to do. Um, so they, again, like for survey methodologists, they need to train them to do this new task that they never had to do before. After they convince people to participate, typically what happens is they collect uh, some uh, biomarkers. So for example, they collect uh, lung capacity, blood pressure, height, weight, and things like that. And then comes the most difficult part where they collect blood. Uh, so the first step is actually to get consent for blood. So there's this big form that they have to sign uh, in which they say, okay, it's, it's okay to get the blood and it's okay to, to keep it for a long time and do whatever you want with it. Yeah? So there are actually different things they have to consent to. And after that, there's another stage where they actually have to collect the blood. So even if they consented, they might not give the blood because, for example, they might be obese or it might be hard to find the vein and collect the blood. Uh, so in all of these three stages, the nurses are very important. Um, and what I'm interested in is if the nurses actually influence the non-response pattern. So do, are some nurses better at convincing people to participate? Are some nurses better at uh, receiving consent? And if that's true, then they are actually influencing the non-response patterns, and we need to take them in, that into account when we correct for it later. And it also gives us insight in if we need to change, for example, the training of our nurses. And to give you an example how the nurses are kind of uh, new and maybe they're not uh, used to doing surveys, uh, so recently me and Joe were trying to look at paradata. So this is data that is collected in the process of a survey and looking at the paradata of nurses that I don't think anybody looked at before. Uh, and basically, the, para the quality of the paradata was horrible, okay? So it wasn't useful. So most of it was missing. There were, yeah, there were really strange things happening. And that's probably, the reason is because they're not used to doing that and they don't think it's important. And that's very different from an interviewer that is trained to do this. Um, okay, so that's one thing. So they have less interviewer training and they have less experience. And also the task is very intrusive. Although I, I know there are economists that uh, would say that actually giving income is more intrusive than giving blood, but still giving blood is quite intrusive, yeah? So uh, it's, it's a very different task than the normal task that we, have, we ask interviewers to do. Uh, so yeah, these are the reasons why I think the nurses are important. And again, this is an empirical question. We don't, I don't know anybody to have looked at this before, so the question is, do they matter? If they don't matter, that it's fine, we can move on. If they matter, we need to do something about it. So this is an example of kind of the process of data collection. So this is from Understanding Society. So you have wave one in this case. Uh, we have some respondents in green and then some non-respondents in red. Then we have wave two, and again, we have some more non-respondents. And then in wave two, a subsample was selected for the nurse visit. And then we have this, uh, this three stages. So we have the nurse visit, we have the consent to blood, and then we have the actual blood collection. And we see that with each stage, we, we are missing some people. And in all of those stages, the nurses are involved. So my question is, do they differentially influence these stages or not? So that's my research question. So how to look at this? So first of all, uh, I'm going to separate the three stages, the nurse visit, blood consent, and blood collection. And the reason I do this is 
uh, because the mechanisms for missing might be different. So for example, if you, for the nurse visit and convincing somebody to participate, you might have non-contact. So it might be related to if people are working or not, or the kind of jobs they have. On the other hand, if you have the nurse visit, uh, you need to get consent. And that, again, is kind of a different process because it might be related if uh, people trust the state or they, pro uh, they trust the nurse or the agency. So it might be related to other things than the mechanisms that lead to uh, missing for the nurse visit. And finally, the, the blood collection also might have different uh, mechanisms. So, for example, it's, it might be because uh, once they collect it, they can't really uh, get the data because they're obese or maybe because just the nurse is not very good at collecting such, such data. Okay, so we have three stages. And then, statistically, to do this, uh, we need to do a couple of things. So first of all, nurses are not randomly distributed around the country. So for example, maybe better nurses are around London, and the nurses that are in a different region are less good. So in order not to have a bias in that, we need to separate kind of area effects and nurse effects. And one way to do this, ideally, would be to randomize nurses all over the country. But that's very expensive, and that will never happen. So one statistical way to do it is to try to separate them using a multi-level model. So we use a cross-classified multi-level model in which you, we estimate uh, for areas, which are LSOAs, uh, uh, and then nurses. And then we also uh, control for characteristics of the respondents and some characteristics of the nurses. So this is statistically how we, we go about it. So the data I'm going to use come from Understand Society. So first we use uh, Understand Society Wave 2. Uh, we have around 25,000 people that were uh, eligible to have the nurse visit. And out of those, around 10,000 gave blood. So our question is, what happened to these 15,000 and if the nurses influence uh, the process of non-response? Then we look at wave three of Understand Society, uh, where they have a new wave of the British Household Panel. So this is an older version of Understand Society that started in 92, if I'm not mistaken. So for there, there we have 9,000 people eligible and uh, around 3,000 gave blood. So these are the two databases that we're, we're looking at. Uh, data collection was done both uh, by Natsen with kind of the same nurses. So in principle, we might expect differences because we have different people. So we have in BHPS people that are older and also people that are very compliant. They've been in the survey for 20 waves, so they're really nice respondents. While in Understand Society, we don't have that. We have more new respondents that uh, might drop off soon. Okay, so first what I do is I have the three stages here. So nurse visit with blue, uh, blood consent with red, and then uh, actually giving blood with green. And then I have here on the left some characteristics of the respondent. So this is for understanding society. So for example, and the scale here is odds ratios. Uh, so if it's bigger than one, then there are higher chances of participating. So for example, for females, they have higher chances of participating in the nurse visit compared to men but they have lower chances to participate in the, uh, to actually give blood compared to men. And this is kind of interesting because it shows that the mechanisms for missing might be different. Yeah? And this is one of the reasons why uh, we m might want to separate them. Um, then we have some things that we expect. So we expect older people to tend to participate more uh, compared to younger people. So this is something that we find uh, often. We find that, uh, for example, having a partner is important for having a nurse visit, but maybe not important for the other two stages, uh, and so on. So there are different kind of patterns. Uh, we find that if you're in London, it's harder to uh, do the nurse visit, as you would expect. Uh, and also, if you have actually a long illness, you're more likely to participate. So these are the characteristics. So we could use information like this in multiple imputation or weighting to compensate for missing data. And again, I, I think one insight is that we have this missing uh, different patterns and we should take this into account maybe when we compensate for missing data. Uh, this is the same thing for BHPS. Most of the patterns are quite similar, so I won't, uh, I won't go into details. So the more interesting part uh, is about how the nurses influence data quality. 
And there are two parts to this. One is the amount of variation. So how, how much of the variation is explained by the nurse in the non-response? And the second part is, is it systematic? So for example, are more experienced nurses better at this than non-experienced nurses? Uh, and that's also interesting because we can use that both in the correction and also in kind of designing data. So we could offer more training for those nurses that have less experience. Uh, so what do we find? So again, here on the bottom we have the three different stages. And then we decompose the variation of non-response into three parts. So this is the nurse part, the area part, and then unexplained. Okay, so what we're interested in is this red part. So the assumption would be that the nurses have no influence. If that's true, this should be zero. So they would explain nothing of the variation of non-response for each stage. So we see that that's not really true. So we see that they influence uh, non-response uh, for the nurse visit. They also do that for consent and the same for giving blood. And for Understand Society, we see that actually the biggest effect is for getting the blood which kind of makes sense because that's where their skills are important. So if you have somebody who, uh, let's say, is obese, then the skills of the nurses are really important in actually collecting the data. For BH BHPS, the effect is kind of similar at all the stages. So we see that around 10% of the variation in non-response comes from the nurse, okay? So one way to think about it is you, as a cluster effect in, uh, uh, in complex sample design. So that's also one way in which you could correct for this. Or you could use something like multi-level in your analysis to correct for nurse effects. The next step was to look at the nurse, nurse characteristics. So unfortunately, we don't have lots of nurse characteristics. We have gender, which is not very useful because 98% are female. Uh, and then we have uh, three other, var oh, actually, I'll go to that in one moment. First, I want to show you these graphs. So these are kind of predicted probabilities from the multi-level model. And the way to read them is each blue point is a nurse. And then they have a probability of getting interviews and then a, a confidence interval. So we expected all of them to be here. But actually, what we find is that some are better than expected and some are less good than expected. Uh, so this is Understand Society, BHPS, and then this is for the first stage. Uh, and we can get the same for consent to blood and the same for having, if they actually collect the blood or not. And this is actually quite interesting because we could use this information in different ways. So first of all, when we design or we collect data, we could actually identify, for example, this group of nurses and offer more training or understand why they're underperforming. Uh, also, we could look at why some nurses are better than the others and take that into account. Uh, and then we can also include these indicators in a different model. So if we want to, co uh, to correct for non-response, we could make an indicator saying this is a better nurse than average or this is a worse uh, nurse than average and put that in our models for non-response. Um, and I think this is kind of interesting information we can just get from uh, after data collection. Okay, so next to the nurse characteristics. So here again, I have just two stages, the blood consent and actually getting the blood for Understand Society and BHPS. Uh, so female, not a lot is happening here. Uh, experience, again, nothing significant. And the only significant finding is for white British. So it's actually, if the nurse is white British, they have uh, lower chances of collecting the blood uh, in Understand Society and BHPS. Uh, but that's the only significant uh, effect we, we found with nurse characteristics. Okay, so a few conclusions. First, we found low to medium effects uh, of nurses. So around, like I said, around 10% of ICC. And again, that might influence uh, standard errors. So I would argue that, well, as a survey methodologist, we should take that into account, at least as sensitivity. And again, we should do that because we have that in the data. So when before publishing, we, you could just control for that and see if you have different results. Uh, we saw that the biggest impact, at least in Understand Society, is actually on the blood collection. Um, so again, we might think why that is the case and maybe offer more training, especially for cases that might be difficult to improve uh, this in the future. And then the nurse characteristics explain only a small part of the variation. So we explain only between 4 and 10% of the nurse variation. 
so clearly there are other things happening that we don't know about. And I think that would be interesting to, I don't know, do a survey of nurses or get more information to understand what really is causing these differences. And again, I think that would be useful both for correction and also for improving uh, the training or improving data, coll uh, data collection. So, okay, what does this mean? So should we stop collecting blood from surveys or what, what, what does it mean? So the answer would be no. So nurses are clearly doing uh, an important job. Like I said, the data is really valuable. We can do new things. Uh, but also we can probably improve the way they do their job. So either during data collection or also trying to train our users to uh, use that information to correct for missing data and convince people like, I don't know, uh, Georgia or, uh, or George to include it in their, in their models for non-response. Because the data is there, it's, it's basically free, and uh, yeah, we should, we, we should use it. So I think that was it for me. Thank you so much.